pay if you are late. All right, uh, this afternoon I'm presenting on the promotion of uh, promoting innovation and business, the role of intellectual property rights. There are so many products um, which are coming onto the markets as a result of uh, human creativity and innovation. And most of those uh, products are as a result of small and medium-sized businesses. However, we, we note that such human innovation and creativity capacity is not fully exploited. It's all because people do not know that there is an intellectual property system which can provide protection. So it is the aim of this uh, presentation that uh, I talk about intellectual property protection. And also, if you do not protect your intellectual property, I think he, uh, during the official opening, the welcome remarks, and the other presentations that came thereafter, I heard about concerns that some ideas have been stolen. Big corporations have stolen ideas. Yes, if you do not protect, that's what you should expect. You can lose your inventions, what you have come up with, what you have created to larger institutions or corporations which are able to even market or commercialize your invention. So, just to give you a summary of the objectives of this uh, presentation, I will introduce intellectual property. What animal is this intellectual property? It's basic concepts as well as principles. I also talk about the options and rules that you can use if you want to protect your intellectual property. And then I also highlight the role that IP protection, wherever you see IP, what does that stand for? It's a short form. <laughs> wherever you see IP, don't get confused. That's intellectual property. I'm just trying to shorten it. Okay. So I will highlight the role of IP protection in promoting innovation and business competitiveness. Those are the objectives I will focus on in this presentation. If you have questions, keep jotting them down until we have time. Okay, <clears throat> when we say intellectual property, we mean creations of the mind. I'm sure that you can know by the word intellectual. The word intellectual tells you that these are creations of the mind. And these creations take different forms. It can be inventions, designs, literary and artistic works, signs, symbols, and names used in commerce, and so on. So those are some of the forms of intellectual property, creations of the mind. And governments grant creators or owners of intellectual property rights, uh, sorry, creators of intellectual property, the right to prevent others from using their inventions or anything they have created without their uh, consent or permission. So when you have created intellectual property, there is a system whereby the government gives you the right, grants you the right to prevent others from using your creation without your consent. And those rights which are given to you by the government are what we call intellectual property rights. Okay. Main branches of intellectual property. Okay. Uh, intellectual property is mainly divided into two. We have industrial property and copyright and related rights. 
Industrial property includes uh, patents for inventions. If you have an invention, you can have that for protected under patents. You can, you can have, uh, you have trademarks under industrial property, industrial designs, and geographical indications. Now, under copyright, that's the second bra main branch of uh, intellectual property. So under that, we have copyright and related rights. So when we talk of copyright, that one, is, it covers literary works, such as novels, poems, and plays. You have films, music, artistic works, for example, drawings, paintings, photographs, sculptures, and arch architectural designs. Those are uh, covered under copyright. But there are also rights which are related to copyright. And these include the rights of performers, producers of phonograms, and broadcasting institutions. I said IP is mainly divided into three uh, branches. Didn't I, didn't I say so? Did I not say so? Okay, you are listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I said two, main, two main branches, industrial property and copyright and related rights. Okay. Now, here I want to give you the categories. There are also emerging categories, which are, are not taken care of in the two categories I talked about. So I want to highlight that. Uh, what you see on the screen is this pink? This, is it pink? Purple. Sometimes uh, I hear that men are colorblind. I don't know. <laughs> uh, one day I was arguing with my wife. Ah, you men are colorblind. Then I was saying, ah. <sighs> do you mean I should have married a white person? I chose you. With my color blindness, I chose you. <laughs> okay. So ladies, don't say we are color blind. We see. Okay. So whatever color you call this, whether pink or purple, I don't know. But uh, these, we have patterns, trademarks, industrial designs, and uh, Geographical indications, those are what are covered under industrial property, okay? And then the green one, I'm sure I'm not mistaken, light green, sort of. I may be colorblind, but this one I may not mistake it for anything. Copyright, that's the second one. Now, the ones, I don't know whether this is orange or yellow, whichever you call it, but these are the emerging categories I want to refer to. Those are the... Uh, Emerging categories like trademarks, you have plant varieties, protection, traditional knowledge, and uh, layout designs of integrated circuits. For the sake of this presentation, I'll focus on patents, trademarks, industrial designs, copyright, trademarks, and layout designs of integrated circuits for this one. Okay, for this presentation. All right, let me start with patents. I'll be asking questions. I don't have enough time. I'll be asking questions before you, your time to ask me comes. And therefore, please put up your hand very quickly and we move. What is a patent? You are not hearing these things for the first time. Please, please, what is a patent? And there are no wrong answers in this room this afternoon. What is a patent? Yes, sir. Is this working? A patent is the registration of an idea which is unique, which you've developed yourself. Okay. okay. Did you hear him? Okay. Uh, I want uh, an another answer. From another person. Thank you very much, sir. 
And then after that one, then we move on. Yes. Um, a pattern protects an invention. Mm -hmm. Come again, come again. It protects an invention, so okay. something that hasn't been done before. Okay, very good, okay. All right, for the sake of time, let me proceed. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen and the lady, for <coughs> uh, defining a patent. You are both correct, but there is more you could add to the definitions, okay? So when we say a patent, uh, <coughs> When we say a patent, it can be defined as a legal document that describes an invention and grants a property right to the owner or to the inventor. Okay? It can also be defined as an exclusive right granted for an invention which is a product or a process that provides a new way of doing something or offers a new technical solution to a problem. So when we talk of an invention, we are not just talking of anything that you come up with. We mean something that is new, inventive, and industrially applicable, and it gives a technical solution to a technical problem. So when you are inventing something, you are actually trying to bring up a solution for something. You cannot create anything that is useless. Why do you have to waste your time for that? You are creating something to, cre uh, to solve a certain problem. So in this case, when we talk of an invention, it must be able to solve a certain problem. Okay? So <clears throat> that's how we can define a patent. Now, patents they give an owner an exclusive right for that invention. What do you think is meant by exclusive right? I said don't waste time, just put up your hand so that we move quickly. Anyone else apart from him who wants to try? What does, yes, if you can speak up. Thank you very, very much. You are just very correct. You are just very correct. Thank you very much. You remember this third paragra uh, paragraph bullet where I said government grants creators or owners of IP the right to prevent, to exclude. That's why we are saying they are exclusive rights. Okay, so government grants creators or owners of IP the right to prevent others from using their inventions. That prevention is what we mean by the rights being exclusive. You are excluding others. They cannot use your invention without your consent or permission. That's what uh, we mean by exclusive rights. Now, <clears throat> You can do a lot of things with your invention or you, what you have created. You can exploit it, you can manufacture and sell, you can use it different ways, you can distribute, you can license others to use it, but others can only use it with your consent or permission. What can be patented? It can be a product. Here I'm just giving an example, like a door lock, for example. It can be a composition. It can be a composition, be it a chemical composition. It can be an apparatus. It can be a process or even just an improvement on any of these, uh, <coughs> like a product, an improvement of a product, a composition or apparatus or a process. Patent rights can be granted for non-complicated things. You see this thing? What do we call this? What? What do you call this? He says paper clip. What do you call it? <laughs> yeah, you are right. When I was growing up, 
when money or cash was available, we used to call it money clip. But now it's, it has this right name, paper clip. Okay, paper clip. Someone patented that in 1889 in German, as simple as all that. Because it is solving a certain problem. You can use it for something else, isn't it? Okay, post it as simple as it is. Someone patented it from a company called 3M. You see, so thus, uh, those are just examples. Okay, <clears throat> now, not everything that you come up with can be protected using a patent. You have to meet, uh, your invention has to meet certain criteria. The first one is it has to be novel. In other ways, it has to be new. If you come up with something that is, you think is new, but uh, someone already came up with it in Zambia, it is, new, it is not new on earth. It could be new in my village, but not new on earth. Okay? So it must be new first in the world. No one must have already done it or used it. So you are the first one to come up with that invention. It must be new. This is where now we must be very, very careful when we come up with an invention. Don't disclose carelessly. Don't disclose carelessly. If you have come up with something that you think is uh, commercially viable, please don't rush to open your mouth and disclose to people. Prior disclosure of an invention uh, means that it cannot be patented. If you disclose, people know about it, then it is not new. So it cannot be. However, you must also be protected. Before you maybe want to engage someone, to partner with someone, to exploit that invention, make sure that you have non-disclosure agreement. These days, don't trust anyone, even if it is your uncle. Don't trust. You must document it. You, you need to have an undisclosure agreement in place so that in case of disclosure and uh, you lose out, you have something to back you up and even uh, take a legal action. Uh, <sighs> My name is Bison Sabora. I work as training officer at the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, ARIPO, in brief. ARIPO is an intergovernment organization. It has currently 19 member states. Zimbabwe is a bona fide member and is hosting the headquarters at 11 Natal Road in Harare. That's Belgravia. So, as an intergovernmental organization, we run with mandates. The, the member states mandated us to grant and register intellectual property on their behalf. So we have protocols, and one of them is what we call the Harare Protocol, meaning that it was agreed in, adopted in Harare. Good. Now, under the Harare Protocol, if you disclose your invention at an official or officially recognized exhibition, you are allowed to file a patent application within six months. If the six months elapse, you cannot apply for a patent. That's the advantage of the Harare Protocol. Okay. The second requirement for patentability, it must be industrially applicable, meaning that it, must, it can be mass produced and used in some form of industry. As I said earlier on, when you are inventing, you are actually coming up with something that can solve a certain problem. And therefore it must be used in some form of industry. So that is another 
the, uh, the second requirement for patentability. The third one is it must be inventive. It must show inventiveness, ingenuity, such that it is not obvious to someone of average skill and knowledge in the field of, in the technical field of the invention. If you say you have invented, it must show that there is inventiveness. Someone who has just the average skill or knowledge in that technological field, it shouldn't be obvious to such a person. Okay? So those are the three basic requirements for patentability of an invention. If your invention is to be protected using a patent. Now, <coughs> we are talking of business and innovation here. How do patents promote innovation and business? IP rights is private research investments in new technologies by allowing you, the creator or the inventor, uh, to recoup from your research and investment. Invention is commercially viable. If you do not protect or if you are not protected, anyone can use it. You don't have the protection. Anyone can use it. Or even can manufacture it, sell it, or do whatever they want. But the protection, the exclusive to recoup from your research and development investment. You know, to come up with something, you invest time, cash, whatever. Okay? So the protection, uh, IP protection system allows you to recoup from your investment. Okay? And the patents usually uh, they are given 20 years. So you are, you are given 20 years to manufacture, sell, whatever you want to do, so that at least you will recover what you invested into research and development or whatever you did. Okay? Without that, no one would be motivated to even invest more. Would you be? No. Because whatever you invent, someone comes, uh, uh, uses it even uh, commercially, and uh, you may not even benefit. So that would not actually motivate um, people to invest more in research. But with patent protection, you are home and dry for 20 years. Okay. How do you recoup your uh, research and development expenditures? One, you can manufacture, use, or sell your products yourself or the process incorporating the technology covered by the patent. So you are exploiting it yourself. Or you can license others. Now, this is where now your permission is granted to allow others. They will use it with your consent. Okay? So you license others to manufacture, to sell, or use the invention in return for fair remuneration. You don't license for free. Yeah, if you are so kind, it's okay. But I'm sure all of us want, uh, want money. Okay, so that's another way you can recoup your investment uh, into the research and development. So you can license others. And also you can assign. By assigning, I mean you can sell uh, your patent rights to someone else. Once you sell it, you are right. Then you are not the right holder. It has been sold. So the one who has bought the rights becomes the new owner of the patent. Okay. How patents promote innovation and business, we continue. Patent protection provides the right holders with the means to defend their rights in law and even to initiate legal proceedings. Should there be an infringement? By infringement, I mean someone is trying to use your rights 
without your consent, without your permission. That's what I mean by infringement. In the case of infringement, then when you have a patent, that's a legal document that uh, uh, confirms that you are indeed the right holder. So you can use it to defend yourself or even to begin or initiate legal proceedings against any infringers. Now, in return for patent protection, all patent owners are obliged to publicly disclose information on their inventions in order to enrich the total body of technical knowledge in the world. We do not want you to, uh, to die and uh, go with your wisdom to the grave. You have to disclose before you are given a patent, it's also uh, a requirement that you have to disclose. Okay, so <clears throat> you disclose to enrich the total body of technical knowledge. Even after uh, the 20 years, uh, uh, <clears throat> people can now enjoy what uh, you did without any problem. But during the 20 years, if you license some people, they also, let's say, to manufacture or to use the process. They will need to know how the invention works. So that disclosure is very, very important. And by ensuring that inventions are made public, patents contribute to scientific progress and promote creativity and innovation by others. And also, <coughs> patents therefore provide not only protection for the owners, but also valuable information and inspiration for future generations of researchers and inventors. Even if you go to the grave, at least you disclosed. Others can improve on it, and life goes on. Who grants a patent? What did I say? You have forgotten. <laughs> the government, yes. That's what I said. The government. So patents are granted by national IP policies, that's intellectual property, uh, sorry, offices, national intellectual property offices, or by regional offices that carry out examination work for a group of companies. Do you know that there is a, a national IP office in this country? What is it called? Come again? What does Zippo stand for? I agree with you except the O. The O is for office. Zippo, Zimbabwe Intellectual Property Office, not organization. <laughs> anyway, 99 out of 100, you have passed. Okay, so there is a national IP office here. And now, I'm saying they can, uh, a patent can also be granted by a regional office like the place where I am coming from, ARIPO, African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, which has 19 member countries, which mandated the secretary, the organization, to register and grant IP titles, including patents, on behalf of the member states. So Zimbabwe, as I said, is a member, so it's uh, among the countries that also use the ARIPO route to... <coughs> to uh, for the grant of uh, patents. Okay, there are other uh, regional organizations like uh, uh, African Intellectual Property Organization. This is mostly for French-speaking countries. Its headquarters is in Yaounde in Mozambique, isn't it? Where is Yaounde? Cameroon, good. The headquarters is in Cameroon, in Yaounde, and it has nine, uh, sorry, Aripo has 19, we have 19 member countries. OAPI has number countries in Africa. There is also another one, European Patent Office. These are just examples of regional, um, regional IP offices. Now, I said the duration of protection for a patent is generally 20 years. I said that already. But when the 20 years lapse, we say that uh, <coughs> the invention has entered the public domain food for everyone. You can exploit it. The period of protection is over. 
so you can exploit it without looking anywhere as if you are afraid you is now free for everyone and when the invention enters the public domain the owner no longer holds exclusive rights there are no more exclusive rights to the right holder no those rights are no, are no more because protection period has lapsed so everyone can now uh, exploit the invention even commercially now IP rights, including patents, are territorial in nature. What do you understand by territorial rights? Quickly, please. Territorial, territorial rights. Territorial, yes, my brother. If you can speak up. Oh, I think uh, let's do a dollar dollar contribution to give him. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very correct. <laughs> That's very correct. Okay. If you register for protection in Zimbabwe and you don't do it in Zambia, you are protected here using the laws of this land. Okay. That's what we mean by territoriality principle. IP rights are territorial in nature. You are only protected in jurisdictions where you have applied for protection. Why should that be the case? It is because in case of infringement, here in Zimbabwe, for example, you can only enforce your rights using the laws of this land, intellectual property laws of this land, which cannot apply to Zambia, to Malawi, wherever. Okay? So that's what we mean by uh, in, uh, the uh, rights are territorial. Okay. I'm, I'm talking about patents, but there are also what we call petty patents, petty patents or utility innovations, which are also called utility models. These are <coughs> exclusive rights that are granted for minor inventions, uh, <coughs> which are mostly uh, improvements of, uh, small improvements or minor improvements of already existing inventions. So, you remember I gave you how many requirements for patentability, basic ones. What, how many did I give you? Three. The first one, it must be novel or new. Second one, industrial applicability. And lastly, it must be inventive. Now, for utility models, uh, <coughs> the inventiveness is not a requirement. They are minor inventions. So it's only uh, that the invention must be new and industrially applicable. Those are the uh, basic requirements for a utility model. Okay. <clears throat> Under the Harare Protocol, which I talked about earlier on, protection is 10 years, while for a patent uh, is 20, but for Minor inventions, which you call, uh, which can be protected using utility models, is 10 years. 10 years. Now, why should you, should a patent application be uh, filed? Or another way of asking the same question, why do you need patent protection? Why? Okay. Key reasons. Strong market position and competitive advantage. We are living in a world of competition. And therefore, when you are protected, your rivals will respect you because you have their protection. So you, have, you are protected for, from free riders and imitators. Others can imitate, but when you are protected, you are... <clears throat> 
they, they can be, uh, that can be discouraged. Imitation can be discouraged. By applying for protection does not mean that people will not try to infringe. You get it? If you build your house and you put burglar's bars, does that mean that a thief will not try to break it? But at least you have put a hedge, isn't it? Yes. So people may try to infringe, but when they do so, you have a backing. You have a backing. Okay. A market entry barrier for competitors, competitors in respect of the same invention. If you are protected in Zimbabwe, others would want to come to Zimbabwe and do the same bus uh, business with the same uh, invention or be bad because you are protected in this land. Secondly, I already talked about it. Once you are protected, you can recover your research and development costs and you can also license others in return for remuneration. You can transfer or sell your rice. Of course, when we are talking of selling, you don't sell uh, and there is no, no dollar. That's money. You can access new uh, uh, technology through cross-licensing. Cross-licensing. What I mean by cross-licensing is I have come up with a, uh, an invention which I have protected by using a patent. And you, you have also your own invention and you have protected by uh, using a patent. You can license me to, to use your invention. In return, I can also license you. So that's what we mean by cross-licensing. And then you can access new markets. I think I already talked about that. Diminished risks of infringement. When people know that this is prote uh, protected, then the um, infringement can be minimized. You can also attract investors for your business. If you have an invention that is protected and is commercially viable, you can, ca you can have investors that can support you uh, in your business. Sometimes it's just for prestige, reputation, or image. Uh, you, can, <coughs> you can use your protection for raising funds, finding business partners, and even raising companies' profile and market value. It's not just that you come up with an invention and you rush to file for a patent. You have to think. So I want to talk about the factors that you need to consider before filing a patent application. Is there a market for in the invention? If you come up with an, uh, with an invention that you cannot uh, bring to the market, then why, why should you file for a patent? After all, uh, if you are to file a patent, there are also fees that must be paid. So you must think, is there a market for the invention? Are there potential licensees or investors who will be willing to help to take the invention to, to market? How valuable will the invention be to your business and to your competitors? You need to think about that. Because all we want is money. Show me the money. Do the expected profits of an exclusive, uh, from an exclusive position in the market justify the cost of patent? So those are some of the factors that you must consider before you rush to apply for a patent because you want to get returns in the end. Now finished about patents, let me quickly talk about trademarks. And I'll use that slide and you'll answer those questions. How can we define a trademark? What is a trademark? Please, please, I don't have enough time. What is a trademark? Have you ever heard of a trademark? What did you hear? Tell us. What did you hear about them? Yes, yes, yes. If you can speak up. A sign or your logo, okay? 
a sign or a logo. That's what he's telling us. I don't know. What is that logo used for or sign used for? For identity, uh -huh. marketing. Uh -huh. Are you scratching your hair or you want to say something? <laughs> okay, okay. All right. When we talk of a trademark, it can be a sign, a symbol, a design, a word, or a combination of words, whatever. That helps us to identify the goals of one entrepreneur from those of another. Am I making myself clear? If you go to buy uh, soap, washing powder, I'm sure you have your preferences, depending on the brand. If you want to go and buy toothpaste, we all go to a shop. I don't think we'll buy the same brand. We have our own brands. So trademarks help us to distinguish the goods of one enterprise from those of another. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> what examples of uh, trademarks do we know? Yes. Are you saying SARS or SADSA? <laughs> <laughs> ah, good. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Um, Standards Association of Zimbabwe, they have, they have a, a trademark. Okay, good. This is speaking faster. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Any examples of, uh, of yes, yes. Coca-Cola, beautiful, that's nice, yes. If you can speak up. Mercedes-Benz, beautiful, that's correct. Okay, did you put up your hand? Uh, she has answered, it is a logo. So a logo is also a trademark. No, that's a, a discussion for another day. For this one, we are just giving examples. Okay. <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, let's move on. So I said a, 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 a trademark is a distinctive sign. which just helps to distinguish the goods and services of one trader from those of another. These are just examples. If you want to go and buy a computer, you have HP, Dell. Mm -hmm. When you see this, okay, you see, these are examples of trademarks. This one, obvious. This one, you know who it belongs to? Where, where we are. This one is obvious. Telecommunication world. Uh -huh. Now, if you see this, what does it stand for? Toyota. Okay, that's now car. Toyota, this one, she said it. Mercedes-Benz, uh, this one is obvious. These are just examples anyway. Examples of uh, um, <coughs> trademarks. Okay, <clears throat> functions of a trademark, they show the uh, source, uh, <clears throat> they help us to identify the source of a product or a service. Okay. Uh, can you, what did you say? If you can speak up, sir. Okay. Validity for a trademark is forever, as long as you continue to renew it every 10 years. Thank you. Okay. Choice is another, another uh, function of a trademark. They help us to make choice, just as I gave the examples. Quality. You know, sometimes we associate quality uh, with certain brands, eh? 
Yeah, I was telling people in Blawayo last uh, was it last week? Yes. That one day when I just came to Zimbabwe in 2010, you know, I came here when my, my hair was so black. But now, I think I have overstayed. <laughs> when I came here in 2010, I went to a shop to buy an iron. And I, I grew up knowing that, ah, Philips is a good brand. Philips is a good brand. So I went to the shop. I got an iron. I reached home. Then I looked at it. I discovered it was not Philips. It was Phipps. <laughs> it was Phipps. You know? So in my mind, I knew that, ah, uh, Philips, the quality is good, and uh, yeah, I just picked without carefully. But from that day, I'm now more careful. Yeah, we can use uh, uh, trademarks uh, for <coughs> thank you for marketing and then uh, for economic uh, purposes. Types of trademarks: you have service marks and uh, collective marks. My service marks enable consumers to distinguish between the services of one company from another. And the collective marks, these are for associations. And then you have certification marks. I think he gave us SARS. I asked it here, but he already said it. That's the board that certifies products here. Is this certified? Is it? There's... there's SARS is here, isn't it? Oh, yeah, we are safe. Yeah, so that's another example. Certification mark, that's the certification mark that SARS put here. Okay, that's certification mark. Importance of trademark protection, I think, is the same as uh, what I have talked about under functions, and also he talks about exclusivity uh, in terms of use. <coughs> Industrial designs... Uh, these are features that mainly uh, <coughs> address the ornamental or aesthetic features of a product. Sometimes we buy product because of their designs, you see. So we also can protect our designs as long as they are new and original and, <coughs> and they are appealing to the eye. Designs are also protected for 10 years, but unlike product, uh, trademarks, they are protected. Uh, after 10 years, they fall into the public domain. Unlike trademarks, after 10 years, you can renew. After 10 years, you can renew forever. Like Coca-Cola has been there even before I was born. Eh? Yes. <sighs> um, I'll ask, I think I'll ask, give her the presentation to circulate. Uh, I don't have the time. Why protect? The, the reasons are the same for the patents, the layout designs. Um, <coughs> yeah, I can also, I think, uh, skip this one. The, the protection of layout uh, designs of an inter integrated circuit, they can also be protected. Mostly they are protected under patents, and the uh, requirements is original, and it has to be fixed in a material form. The rights, I don't think they are different. I'm just trying to rush. Copyright, uh, let me describe copyright using this slide only. Uh, copyright is a bundle of rights which allows the owner exclusive rights to one, copy or, pr or reproduce, to publish, perform in public, communicate your work, make an adaptation, you can rent uh, your work, you can prevent importation of infringing works and the, or even assign or sell or license your rights. So that's how I can summarize copyright. It's a bundle of rights that gives you these specific rights. Okay. Copyright, uh, unlike uh, industrial designs, utility models, trademarks, patents, which need to be registered, copyright is automatic. You don't need registration. It's automatic. But we are also encouraging voluntary registration. Okay. Uh, 
trade secrets. These are, <coughs> if you think that uh, uh, the information that you have is uh, very important and you, you, you go, good for your business, it will give you competitive, competitive advantage. You may decide to keep silent, protect using trade secrets. So you protect using trade secrets. It means you don't disclose. That's a secret. You don't disclose. However, you need to make sure or put in place measures that will indeed help you to keep that a secret. Okay? Because if that is not done, then uh, you can be finished and completely finished if people discover your secret. You can be pushed out of business. In conclusion, IP rights provide a basis for businesses to prevent others from copying their products or using their inventions without permission, to create a strong brand identity, to gain revenues through licensing, assignment or selling or franchising or other IP transactions. They increase uh, the business, uh, the commercial value of the business. The business can use IP rights to, com uh, to access new markets. You can even use your IP rights to engage in different types of business partnerships. And you can also uh, use your IP rights to ensure freedom to operate. You are uh, either owning or licensing in key IPR areas. Let me just explain this last point that sometimes to avoid infringing on other people's IP rights, it's good to, to get your, a license yourself from the owners of those IP rights. It's safer that way than infringing because you may end up paying more for the infringement. <sighs> At last. <laughs> your Majesty, I'm done. Thank you, sir. I think you're very popular. He's very popular with the ladies because they, they're the first ones to go. I think they want to protect their intellectual property uh, into, because they are in partnership with men who will steal from them. She's saying no. She says it's the other way around. So it's the young men who are clapping because they are supporting what he has said. So thank you so much, uh, doctor, um, for that uh, presentation on intellectual property rights and protection. We are happy with the presentation? No? Oh, okay. Can we give um, the next presenter um, the opportunity to present on almost a related um, topic, then we can ask questions. So I'm going to um, introduce to you Ms. Uh, Aram Lambo, who is um, going to talk to us about safeguarding and uh, enforcing your intellectual property rights in ICT innovation proposals. So um, I will give the opportunity to Ms. Mnambo, who is here, to talk to us about that issue. Uh, good afternoon. How are we feeling? Oh my, tired. So how has been the, the, the day so far? Excellent. Okay, great, because they saved the best for last night. <laughs> so anyway, my name is uh, Rundizai Mlambo. Um, I do a lot of things. Uh, I'm a founder of an organization called Tech Women Zimbabwe, if you've heard about it. And I'm also an intellectual property specialist, but this role is actually going to be evolving over ne the next week or so. How many of you are from the University of Zimbabwe? Uh, do we still have the students from the UZ? Okay, so in the next few days, I'll be joining the University of Zimbabwe, and I'll be heading a new company that they have formed, which is an innovation and commercialization company. So 60% of my time will be spent on that. Uh, commercializing and you know harnessing the innovations from the university it's a new strategy that the university is taking and I'm really excited to be a part of it because of my background in uh, intellectual property and uh, what I have done 
So basically in patents, my work involves spending a day going through millions and millions of patent documents. I mean, there are over 200 million uh, patent documents that are in existence. So ev every time someone wants to file, I have to do a search to so that I verify the novelty that uh, Mr. Sabola talked about. So is it novel? Is it inventive? So I have to go through some of the biggest databases in the world to actually see whether that invention does meet those requirements. So it's not an easy task. It's a very complicated task, but for me it's exciting because I like technology. And every time I'm coming across the latest technologies, five years, 10 years before they're even in the market. So it's very exciting for me, but it's not easy. But this is the level at which a patent is. So when we're talking about patents, we're not talking about something that is as simple as people, I mean, it's simple, it, it can be simple. Uh, for example, like how Mr. Sambola uh, explained the paperclip and so, but the, the standards have to be global. It has to be something that's bringing something new to the world because those exclusive rights that they give you should not be taken for granted because for those 20 years, that means no one in the world can do what you're doing, right? So in order for the government to grant you that right, it has to be done in a manner that is thorough so that you deserve to get that grant. So one of the things that I do know is that when I'm, when uh, I think there's, a, I think five, five years ago, I went to the Silicon Valley. I worked at a company called Juniper Networks, which is into hardware, your routers and all that. And one of the things that they did teach me was before they invest in anything, they have to see the intellectual property. There's nothing worth investing in the technical space if it does not have intellectual property attached to it. Because the risk that they're taking to give you the millions, they should at least have enough time to recoup those mo that, that, that amount of money. And they even took me to the venture capital firm that invested in the founder of that company. And you know they were taking me through the processes and it's the same thing. If it's technical, I need to see the IP first, you see? And then that gives them a certain level of confidence because of the thoroughness of the process of granting a, a, a patent or a trademark or whatever other rights is given in intellectual property because there are people who are employed just to examine. And then there are, there are lawyers that are specialized, that are engineers, PhD engineers or scientists who also have to help you to draft that patent so that it qualifies and meets the requirements. So intellectual property is very important. And the process is also there to also reassure the investors that this is worth investing in. So it's usually the first point of call before you even go to, to the funders to seek investment, to say, what is the, the, the search report from Aripo or from the, the IP office? Have they deemed that this is inventive, it's novel, or it's industrially applicable? So if you have a good report, so as, uh, with uh, industrial property, you are protected from the date of filing. So you can file today, and maybe your certificate will come after a year or two or three years. But at the point of filing and when you get a report which is less than a year, you are actually then able to go seek investment. And if an investor sees that search report from the lawyer or from the IP office, then they are really confident of your, 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 your invention. So today, what I'm just going to do is I'm going to apply what Mr. Sabola, uh, Mr. Sabola talked about to the ICT sector. So is it software? I think there's a, there's a huge debate about whether software is patentable. How many of us believe software is patentable? How many of us believe it's not? Okay, so there is a big debate about that. So I just, I'm, I'm going to clarify that so that you do know where your invention or innovation lies. And um, so I'll just go through the options. I'll look at how you enforce and how, what systems you need to have in place for you to not, uh, you know, neutralize or dilute that right. So basically, like I said, IP in software is highly debatable or debated, but it's only a, just a matter of clarity that I think people need to understand what it is that the law says and what is applicable. And then with hardware, hardware is a bit straightforward. If you have anything tangible in ICT, which is novel, inventive, and industrially applicable, 
it can be protected as a patent. So globally, the intellectual property rights have been seen to be a key component of economic development. That cannot be understated. If we look at the Silicon Valley, we look at the Asian giants that are coming up, intellectual property has been the key factor in the development of those economies. So I think a, a lot of people do give the example that South Korea and China in the early 1980s, it was the same as African countries, all these are developing countries, all these are poor countries, they need aid. But then now, they're actually becoming giants, even going bigger than the developed countries, that is the US and Europe. But that was through the utilization of intellectual property rights. And I think in 2016, the World Intellectual Property Organization reported that the global GDP was contributed to by intellectual pro property. I think it was about 2.5 trillion, only directly from uh, intellectual property. I mean, everything else can be, you know, secondary. I mean, you've developed IP to use by others in business and what, what, what. But the direct contribution was about 2.5 trillion, which just goes to show how important the intellectual property rights are. And as a country, we cannot ignore this. We have to use intellectual property rights and we have to take them seriously. And there is no easy way. I think in the morning, uh, some of the questions and some of the discussions around just developing a proposal, you know, and how innovators are failing to develop a proposal. I was really astounded. I think even in Bloe, we had the same discussion. And I'm like, huh? If we can't do that, then how do you develop a patent? How do you get to that level if, you, if writing a proposal is so difficult for you? And I think, um, one, in my experience, uh, I also spent two years at Aripo uh, doing patent examination, being trained on patent examination. And I think for four months, they sent me to the Japan Patent Office. And I'll tell you, there is no excuse that you, have, you give to those people. It has to be meticulous, it has to be thorough, it has to be good. Those people, are, their standards are that high. And I think we need to adopt the same thing. You cannot say, I'm just because I'm an innovator, I can't write, I don't know how to do financials. Then if you don't know, get a job. Because that's how, the, those are the standards that we have globally. No one is supposed to babysit anyone. If we want to compete globally, we have to take it seriously. So globally, how SMEs are used, utilizing intellectual property rights, they're doing this to exploit innovation in order to launch new products and services. So if you want to launch a new product, you protect it, and then you gain a competitive edge in the market, and then you gain access to funding. You'll find that globally, in, especially in, in the Asian countries, Europe, America, they have special funds dedicated to intellectual property. So in Africa, it's still a bit sophisticated because our banks and financial institutions and funding organizations haven't actually understood or grasped how they can uh, you know, fund invest, uh, you know, intellectual property rights. But of course, this is slowly changing. I think at our firm, we're working with a few banks to actually train them in IP and how they can securitize intellectual property rights. So your patent, because it's a property right, it should function the same way as your house or your other assets that are property. And then exchanging IPR in business alliances. So you find that maybe your invention or innovation is not adequate on its own, but if you come together with a group of people, that's, that's the, that your, all your innovations affect maybe the, 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 the functionality of, maybe if it's a router or if it's a laptop, if, we, if you combine that becomes competitive, you can come together and then you sell it as one product instead of individually going at it alone. And then that's what uh, I think Mr. Sabola did talk about cross-licensing. So your mobile phone, some patents are owned by Samsung, some by Apple, but the exchange, in order for that final product to come into play, it's not just one, uh, it's not just an IP portfolio of one company, but it's actually several companies. And then you also can use intellectual property rights to block competitors. And I think there's one inventor uh, who is in Zimbabwe now, but he was uh, in South Africa. He said that um, he got a patent for a very innovative robotics pat uh, patent in when he was at Stellenbosch. And then Ford bought his patent. He got like millions of runs. But they did that just to put it aside, to say, no, we don't want you to go into the market and we don't want anyone else to get into the market. So we'll just buy it, give you money, but it's not gonna be used. So it's a strategy as well. So some people just look out for things that are going to 
infringe on their products, then they buy it out, they buy you out, and then they just continue with their business. You as the creator still get your money. You still get your money. So it's still it's still okay. You can come up with your next invention. You have capital. It's fine. And then uh, there are some global intellectual property rights opportunities that you have. So like I'm saying, our sector in Africa is not well established, right? So you can have a patent and people ignore you. They don't care. And you know, you, you know you're just like, ah, what can I do? But there are platforms through which you can actually gain benefit from your intellectual property rights. So there are online platforms that you can use for patent exchanges. So these are markets for patents. So you put up your patent on the platforms. I think WIPO even has one. You say, I've got this technology, it's protected by a patent, blah, blah, blah. Anyone globally can actually license or buy or you know, exchange revenue or work with you in any way. And then there are also IP market platforms, which, um, which are just for buying and selling. It's like your e-commerce, but e-commerce in patents, IP and other, you know, just not patents, I mean utility models, industrial designs and all that. You can just put up your, 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 your IP there and someone can, can, uh, can look and, and then uh, say, okay, we want this. And then patent value funds, which you can also access if you've got a very imp important patent, which is very important to a certain sector. There are those for green technologies, there are those for agriculture, those in ICT, software, you know, and you know globally we have standards, especially in the ICT sector for interoperability, what is it? Yeah, so something, uh, that, that word. <laughs> so if you have that kind of a patent, which will be, you know, like Wi-Fi, which is used by different operators, some people can actually just buy it and or just invest in it so that everybody else can use it. And then there are different business models that are used. I think there are three main types of business models that are used in ICT. We've got the open soft software business model where people actually use open source products to actually make money. I'm sure there are people here who use those, but I will also then just show you how you also have to be careful because open source is based on copyright licenses, right? So it is IP, it is copyright, and you do have to follow uh, certain rules that are there in the copyright licenses and uh, which is I think here an IP, ma IP management issue but I'll just uh, go through that when I get there and then those that are based on new technology firms so you're just an, a company that creates new to technologies they're just creating you create you sell your license you create you sell your license new any, uh, uh, that anything that is new but you have to always be ahead of your competitors but um, that means you have to be investing in a lot of uh, R&D. And sometimes these companies don't do the actual development themselves. You outsource, you're just good at creating. And I think one of the observations that I've had also from overseas is that the, the creativity part can actually be outsourced as well. I remember we got to a company where they were like, okay, we take this computer, we take this, and then we take a doctor, a teacher, a layman in the street, they put in them in one room, and then they start saying, what do you want this to do for you? You know, that kind of thing. Then they get all that, they crowdsource all that information, and then the developers then develop solutions to that. So it's also very possible to do that. And then there's the cooperative innovation business model, where you're working with other people, exchanging, cross-licensing, and uh, working together as a consortium. So in terms of software, there are different ways in which you can protect software. So for the source code and your object code, you can use copyright. Uh, trade secrets can also be used in the source code and the data structures. For patents, we protect only the functional aspects of the software. So this is process methods, systems, and you know data structures as well. And then there's issues around business method patents. So with software, you are not supposed to say, I am, this, is a met this is a software in your patent. You say this is a process for doing A, B, C, D. So it's how you, you word your patent that makes sure that they, they grant it or they don't. And then we have trademarks, distinguishing you from your competitors, industrial designs for the aesthetic appeal, and then databases for original creative arrangements. These are protected under the, 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 the copyright law, but you can get protection for your database. So in terms of protecting software, 
you have to identify the core of your software. So for example, it can be uh, based on uh, controlling uh, you know, a machine or regulating a room temperature. I think he has sensors and all this kind of system for his agricultural products. So the software has to be performing some sort of action that's going to affect hardware and you know, something that's going to, to have a technical output. So that's how you, you look at a patent. So is it something that's going to be monitoring communication network system or provide interfaces between a computer and a human being or something like that? So depending on that core, it could be an apparatus. So the patent will be an apparatus for doing A, B, C, D, or it could be a system for doing A, B, C, D. It could be an algorithm. It could be a method. It could be a network, you know, the processing of data or the software itself, but you do not say software in the patent. And then, like uh, we talked about the trademarks, they are very important. They give you lead time. So for example, if Econet today, or Net1, or, Tel or Telesel was to launch a product today, which is the same as yours, chances are that the market will go for, for the well-known trademarks. So a trademark is also very important because even if you don't protect, sometimes you can gain lead market, uh, lead, lead time in the market because people already know you, they already associate your brand with a certain level of you know, uh, you know, quality and all that. So one of the first point of calls is that you have to protect your trademarks, especially as you are starting. So if you then give consistent quality, consistent service, with time the market will just trust anything that you bring out. So it's something that you have to do, even if you don't have money for a patent, start with the trademark. It's very important. And of course, the brand is also based upon how you perform and interact with people. So you can claim it by just adding the name TM, or you can register it, and then you can put ARA. So if you see an ARA on a trademark, it means that it has been registered. So that is, it means it has been protected in the intellectual property office. And here I've just given an example of Uber and Lyft. So Uber and Lyft, uh, they, they did their branding differently. So Uber was the first. They, were, they had an executive type of feel when they started out. And then this was an opportunity for Lyft to come in. So when Lyft came, they're saying, okay, it's something similar, but how do we differentiate ourselves? How do we associate our name differently from Uber? And then they were like, okay, we're gonna do it together. I'm sure you all know the story of Lyft and, or, and how the founder was in Zimbabwe. And he came to Zimbabwe and you saw how we were getting into the combis together. And if you talk to anyone from Lyft, they tell you about this Zimbabwean story. They came, he looked at how people were sharing rides in the combi. He stood there and like, hmm, this is interesting. This is how I can compete with Uber. So with Lyft, it can be three, four people going to the same direction. They pick you up, you share the fare, different from Uber, which is just one person. So then this appeals to people who want to cut costs and all that. And because of that, Within a year, I think the company had already 3,000 employees, they were already making millions, and now they're also a billion dollar company. But then the branding mattered, how they chose to say we want to differentiate ourselves in this particular way. And then the Google Drive icon is also this, and you can also have a dynamic moving icon. And then with industrial designs, when they're applied to ICTs, you can get protection for the graphic user interface, the way you design your user interface uh, is very important. That can be protected and uh, that can be also, you know, an, an industrial design. The display, the display screen is also protected and the small icons that you create for each individual apps can also be protected as industrial designs. So if you have animation, specific color combinations that are unique, those can also be protected, the sounds, um, uh, are also very important. So these graphic user interfaces are very important, especially like for example in smartphones. So all those designs by Apple, if you prefer the, the look of the Apple screen, that is actually protected as an industrial design. And during my time at Haripo, these guys protect in every country. You find that the most industrial designs are filed by Samsung, Apple, they actually file those things even in the smallest countries in the world because they care about their brand. And then also the way people swipe on your screen, whether it's in the phone or on the desktop, 
the difference between Snapchat and Facebook. That's how Snapchat became important. If you swipe to the left, this happens. If you swipe to the right, that is also protected as an industrial design. And then we have copyright, which is what a lot of people believe that software is uh, protected with. Well, it is very important to use copyright in software, but what happens is you only protect the literal expression of your code. So when I'm saying literal, I'm saying the way you write it, if it's whatever, whatever things that you're putting, whichever language you're putting, you protect it in that way. But uh, you're not protecting the technical output of the software. So for example, uh, someone can write a code to, to, to do something in Python, then somebody writes it in Java. So that person writing it in Java is not infringing on your copyright. Because it copyright protects word to word exactly how you're writing it down, how you're expressing it, right? So the functionality is not protectable under copyright. So you have to know that the functionality is protected using patents or industrial design or your, 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 your utility model, depending on what you've selected to use. So you can then also use the, 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 the databases in terms of uh, copyrights. So like I'm saying, copyright protection extends only to expressions and not ideas, procedures, methods of operations, or mathematical concepts. So these other issues have considerable commercial value. So you have to be aware of that. And related to copyright is your open source software, which is very important. It reduces your development time. It, you know, you, you, you can actually get into business quicker because you don't need to develop anything from scratch. But the, you have to be aware of the copyright license under which that open source is being released. So when you get an open software product, there are three main uh, uh, types of uh, uh, licenses that they are released under. So we have the permissive attribution licenses, which require that you know just mention that you got it from this person or this uh, you know company, and you know you have to provide the copy of the open source uh, license when you are now distributing the product. So if you're selling to a certain company, you also have to attach the original source, source code that you actually used. And then you also acknowledge the original author. So these types of license are, for example, your Apache and MIT. So if it's a product that is released uh, by Apache and MIT and you just do those minimum requirements, then you're fine. And then we go to the copy, weak copyleft licenses. And uh, these have additional restrictions if you modify. Remember when you take that open source you're going to modify it a bit, you're going to add a bit of your own code, and you're going to make it do extra things, you have to be aware of the license as well. If it's a weak copy li uh, a copyleft license, um, you have to do what is required by the permissive uh, licenses, but in addition to that, you have to not all modifications. So anything that you modify, it has to be recorded, and you have to provide it. Right? And you also have to provide this to the whole community of developers. And uh, you also make your modified source code available for free because you've gotten the s your initial code for free. So your modification, your modified code should also be out there for free. And you have to make all unmodified source code available. So that means the original source code plus the modified have to all be released uh, out there for free. So you have your common uh, public licenses, your Eclipse public licenses. So all these, if you find that the open source platform that you're using is under one of these, then you have to make sure that when you're releasing the product or when you've fi finished your development, you also have to do this. And then we have the viral or strong copyleft licenses. And uh, you have to do everything else that has been mentioned, but you have to make source code available for all work distributed under the general uh, public licenses, including derived works de uh, regardless of modification. And if there is a patent to anything that you have modified or you have added to this, you are supposed to grant it uh, on a royalty-free basis, a license basis. So that means you can, anyone should be able to use that without paying you anything. 
So those are the general public licenses, the lesser general public licenses. So if your, 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 the platform that you're using has any of this, you have to be aware of that. So like I think I did described some of these things and obviously in selecting your open source uh, software platform, you have to note whether it's a, an established uh, community of developers, it's gonna always update and you have to also be aware of the security vulnerabilities out there because if you don't know who uh, produced it, you may not know what bugs they've put in there to, to actually take advantage once this is going to be on the market. And um, I, I, I'm getting this slide from the time I was at uh, Juniper because before I touched any, any computer or anything of theirs, I had to undergo training in open source uh, licenses and copyright. And they were saying um, they had an incident where they had developed a product, a hardware product, and they did not uh, you know, maintain all these requirements and they had to stop product shipment they also had to re-architect the product. So there are ways of in which you use different architecture so that you separate the open source from your own proprietary code. They hadn't done that, but they had to do that so that they didn't have to release their proprietary stuff for free. And um, they had to pay monetary damages to the open source community. And you know, their source code, proprietary code had to be released for free and uh, all that was done. So I think I talked about patents and software and uh, the difference between the, your, your patent and the existing state of art should be significant and essential to the invention. There are patents that are granted for small differences, small differences to existing products. But I think as a patent examiner, what you also look at is what is the impact. So for example, if you do something or modify something to the extent that it reduces the cost by maybe half or more than half, then that can also be pro protected, regardless of the fact that maybe it's not that novel, maybe it's not that inventive, but if it does that, if, if there's that significant uh, impact in terms of pricing, then you can actually uh, get protection. And then, so these are examples of what you can protect in software patterns, your data compression, your audio compression, image compression, video compression, I think, you also get this uh, slides, your gaming systems, your search engines. I'm sure if you go, are we, have we ever used the patent database? Are we aware of the patent databases that are available? Okay, so in terms of uh, patents, like the database that I use in my work, you use uh, Google patents. So you usually use Google search, but if you go on Google search and you put in Google patents, it will give you one of the largest patent databases in the world. So Google has actually taken time to, 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 to com co co compile that. So if you go there, you type anything you want, you'll find it. If it's video compression, if it's you Apple, you can type search for the name of the inventor, name of the company, what they own, what they filed, it's all there. And remember, I think Mr. Sabola did say the patent system you have to disclose. So it's there, it's disclosed for you to use, read, learn, and apply to your own work. So you can actually get that. Then the European Intellectual Property Office has the ESPASNES database. You can go onto that. It's a bit more complicated, but you can actually go to the help section and then they'll tell you how you search because you actually have to come up with some sort of a mathematical thing because it's millions of documents. I can type phone and get 500, maybe million or 500,000 results. So then if you want something specific, there's a way to do it so that you just get maybe one hit or two hits that are just specific to what you want. And then the USPTO, the US Patent and Trademark Office, they also have a database that you can use. And all these are for free. You can search, use, and like Mr. Sabola said, these are territorial rights. So if it's not protected in Zimbabwe, you can use it without paying anyone any damages. And I think there's a time that there's a company uh, that was made to pay some licenses and all that. And by the time they came to us, we realized that this patent was not even protected in Zimbabwe. They didn't even have to protect, uh, to pay license fees for this product. So you also have to, to, to be aware of that. You go there, it'll show you which countries in which it's protected. It, it, they don't usually protect in all countries or they don't maintain. So even on the database, you can see whether they've paid maintenance fees in Zimbabwe. If they haven't, 
you can go ahead and use it. And what the utility model system does, I know there was this discussion of saying you are bringing something that has already been done. So with the utility model, Mr. Zabola said it protects novelty and industrial applicability, not inventiveness. So that means you can take something from outside the country and protect it as a utility model and then use it in the country. So uh, utility models are only um, you know, examined on a local scale. So it's just if it's novel, so novel means new. If it's new to Zimbabwe, it's okay. Then they'll protect it. If it's not, but patents have a global standard, which is new to the whole world. So some people actually do that. They will bring in technology, protect them as a utility model, so that you can also gain something from do bringing it to Zimbabwe, because you will invest money in that. So that return on investment can come when you protect as a utility model. So also, I'm just going to give you a few examples of patents. There's video, Adobe video editing software. It's also protected as a patent. You can go through that. And then these are the 10 patents that made a billion dollars. And you'll see that they're all software. Essentially, they're all software. So this is the drop, uh, Dropbox uh, network folder synchronization process. This is a patent that made a billion dollars. Um, we have FireEye, which is just uh, your, your system and method of t detecting computer worms. And you can tell from the diagrams, it's very simple, not too complex, but this pattern made a million billion because, I mean, it was the first time in the world at that time. Now it's obvious, but at that time in 2004, it did make a, a, mil a billion. And then we have a gaming uh, a challenge, the way you assign values and you know, all these uh, armor things that you do to games. The person who came up with that got a patent that made a billion dollars. And then this is a swiping uh, system that also made a billion dollars. You can just Google the 10 patents that made a billion dollars. And then this is a medical field. And then Facebook, obviously, Google, you can also not leave Google out. And then Apple. Uh, the patents that made them a, a billion dollars. You can just go through that. And then uh, we have uh, trade secrets. So if you do not have money to file, you can actually protect your innovations through tra trade secrets. And this is something that is protected by law. So a secret is protectable. But then how do we, um, how do we enforce it? Does anyone know? So you've got a secret. And then you go in to the court and say, somebody stole my secret. Do you think that's feasible? <laughs> it's actually very feasible. In intellectual property law, we do protect trade secrets, like Mr. Sapola uh, said. So like maybe, for example, if I go into the Coca-Cola recipe, whatever. But the way you enforce it is that you have to show evidence that you have taken steps to try and keep it secret. You, it must have commercial value. And the secret should not be discernible just by merely, you know, inspecting the commercial distributed product. So if it's hardware, I shouldn't be able to say, okay, in order to connect this to this, and they probably used something, you know, it shouldn't be that obvious. It should be something that's hard to, to, to tell just by looking at a product. And then if somebody reverse uh, engineered, well, unfortunately, then we can't enforce. And then... You have to limit distribution of that secret information. So I'm sure you know Coca-Cola only has few people in the top company who know. And then some just know one part of the formula. And they mix that product. Some know the other part. Some know the other part. So there has to be a system in place that not everybody in the company knows about it, right? And I'll tell in the ICT sector, the Google, some of its algorithms are, are secret. They've protected some of it as patents, but some of their best algorithms they've decided to keep to themselves, which is why you can use any search engine, but it will not be the same as Google, you know? And then um, you have to secure facilities and files. Your office is not something that people should just walk in and out of, you know, just like that. There has to be some certain level of security measures around there. And you have to have policies and procedures with new employees and people that you come in contact with um, to actually keep it secret. So these are some company policies that you should have in place. And uh, employees, 
you have to have your non-disclosure agreement and your non-compete agreement. Do we know what non-compete agreements are? So besides you saying you should keep this secret, I'm disclosing it to you, there's also something that says if I disclose this to you, for the next three years you're not allowed to do the same thing as I've disclosed. So usually you find that in employment, partnership contracts, or maybe when you outsource uh, you know, development, you have to have that non-compete clause to say, even if I've told you this, even if you know this, for the next three, five, depending on the technology, you can't do this exact same thing. And employers should have manuals. And like I say, databases can be protected. And um, this is because of the creative arrangement that you actually have in that arrangement. So I will skip some of these the slides about, uh, you know, your practical consideration. It's because this, I think, is discussed in determining first whether it's in inventive or novel. And, yeah, what is the end goal of your product? And, yeah, your in-house your in, in systems. And basically, in terms of uh, management, you have to have an IP management system. If there's a company here which does not have that, very, very sad. You have to know which are your IP assets. Do you have trademarks, industrial designs, trade secrets, patents, utility models? They have to be documented. You have to know which, your, uh, which are your IP assets. You have to record them. You have to audit them, per, uh, you know, periodically renew fees if you have to, you know, sell them if you're not using them. You know, you just don't keep it because, just because it's you who created it. You know, you just don't keep it to yourself. If you feel you're, you can't use it, somebody else may benefit, just sell it out or license it out depending on what you want to do. And then when you're meeting or partnering with people, you have to conduct due diligence with whoever you work with. You just don't work with anyone. Somebody says, ah, I've got this platform, I've got this, I think you can use it. Like the open source things that we talked about, know that person, know what they've used, you have to do your due diligence, know if they own IP. So there's difference between ownership and creatorship in intellectual property. So if I create the default position is that I own that is the default position of intellectual property rights. So if there is no contract or written document that says I have assigned this to the employer, the company, or the partner, or the person who has, uh, you know, said I should develop, then I own the intellectual property. So you have to make sure in all your partnerships, you make sure that they have assigned the rights to you. But you always have to acknowledge the person who created, even though they don't own so I'm sure if you apply for a patent at a repo, if the company is the one applying and the inventor is an individual, whoever it is, even if you're the owner of the company, you have to provide an assignment document to show that there has been assignment from the creator to the company. So that has to be clear. I think there was once a case where somebody developed a website for a certain company. They did a lot of innovation, came up with nice images and what, 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 graphics and all that, and then they paid. And then this company then used that design and everything on the website in their corporate material, flyers and all that, and they were found to be liable. They had to pay him extra for use of that because they had not assigned that intellectual, uh, intellectual property on the website to themselves. So this developer still owned all this. So you have to be very careful. So I think, yeah, this is what I can say. I think my presentation will not, uh, I think I've been given time limits, but then just to show, say that um, when it comes to intellectual property, there is also, we should also be aware that a large percentage of cyber crime is actually intellectual property crime. So if you look at the statistics of uh, uh, cyber security crime, you'll realize that a significant those that I've highlighted in red are actually intellectual property crime. So as you develop products for your clients, and solutions, you should know that you have to safeguard their IP because that's one of the targets outside of money. Money is the second. The first is intellectual property, then money. Those are the, the highest, uh, you know, cyber crimes that are happening. So you have to be aware of that. Those that are in um, e-commerce, you don't put products that you don't know the originality or the, you haven't authenticated the owner of the business and services. You have to put things there. That don't, that don't violate some third party intellectual property rights. And then we have uh, internet service providers, they have an obli obligation to say if somebody is infringing on your intellectual property rights online, 
they should have take down procedures to ensure that they take down any person or platform that's infringing on your intellectual property rights. Domain names are now being recognized as part of the intellectual property system. So if you take a domain name that is a registered trademark of a company and you use that or register it so that you can sell it to them, that's actually a violation of intellectual property rights. And it's uh, actually um, something that is uh, punishable. They'll take down or they'll take it away from you. And so if you also use trademarks in meta tags, keywords, hyperlinks, and adwords that do not belong to you or that are registered as trademarks of other companies, you're actually violating third-party intellectual property rights. So, for example, you are whatever innovation company, then you take Potras and put it as a meta tag or keyword on your website, but Potras is a registered trademark, you may actually be found to be violating intellectual property rights. And I think that will be it. Thank you. Those who are using portraits is uh, going to send you some bills. And I can send them bills. Yes. <laughs> you don't think so? It is. Well, thank you so much, um, Mr. Mbizai um, Mlambo. Um, she's excellent, isn't it? Um, very good um, facts and knowledge and... Um, you know, um, things that we take for granted every day. I think for me, the presentation just opens my eyes and um, challenges me to just really be careful when you're dealing with these issues. So we're going to go to our question and answer session. <laughs> I like that. At the corner there, you know, before I even finish my question, my, my remark, Ato Simuza Mahoko. So, we're going to start there, right at the corner there. Cool. We'll start there. Mr. Amjuru, you want a question or you want to add? You have a question. So, we're going to, you know, the first three questions, you'll be the last of the, th of the three. Okay. Afternoon. Uh, my name is Elijah Kutsiwa. Um, <coughs> I've got a question. Uh, maybe it, it may be pertaining to all of the slides that uh, I've been Mm -hmm. uh, seen today. Mm -hmm. um, what, let's say I'm a programmer. Well, I've been privileged to go and study abroad in Russia, mm -hmm. and I came back. And uh, I was also privileged to work with uh, a search engine there, which is called Yandex. Mm -hmm. um, and what they actually do is um, they are like a competition to, to Google. Mm -hmm. So when you're in Russia, you are entitled to use that search engine. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was developed by some students. And what they actually did is they went to an organization like Potras, mm -hmm. and then they told them their idea, and then they supported them mm -hmm. by actually saying, like, every government officials, every government parastata or something, like they should use this search engine. Mm -hmm. So let's say I come up with something which is along those lines. Mm -hmm. Can Potras be able to help me um, uh, market my product mm -hmm. to the government, because government as a body, mm -hmm. it's large and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good market as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So can Potras also be able to, to help me if I have a product which is similar to that, mm -hmm. because on my own, if I want to fight, for example, Google, mm -hmm. I can't. Okay. But if Potras as a, uh, a regulatory body, mm. can they be able to, to help me with um, marketing my product, something like that? Profita Hirija Rataur. You're next? Do I go? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, Are you also a prophet, Hirija? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. My name is Tavazo Sharonga. Uh, uh, you are Tavazo, you're not the prophet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Zogora. Okay. Uh, Chief Sose. Uh -huh. Weza. Ah, good. Right. Um, <laughs> my question is to Dr. Sabola. Um, what's Aripo's uh, relationship with. Uh, music collection societies mm -hmm. um, and then the second part of that question is um, what what under under Aripo what is the, 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 the timeline for a copyright to get into the public domain okay and is there a fee for registration all right thank you so much um, Mr. Mjuru you want to ask um, th thank you very much for for, for the presentation um, uh, Rumbi uh, my, my question is on um, the, the emerging technologies, things like uh, blockchain, 
we, we have uh, Internet of Things, we, we have um, uh, drones, for example. C can I register a domain name called blockchain.co.zw as, as Mujuri? Rundi is going to ask, answer. So respond to the first one. Mm, no, the first one is Mujuru. Are they all Mujuru? But Mujuru's question is yours. Yes. <laughs> okay, so in terms of domain names, uh, blockchain, it's, uh, if it's not registered as a trademark, you may be able to get it. But increasingly what is happening is that people in different sectors of the economy are actually then coming together and saying, you know what, we should not allow such a domain name to be registered. So if you look at Europe and America, they've actually got certain uh, groupings that actually challenge uh, certain domains, especially if they refer to a whole grouping, you're all in blockchain. So why should one person get that exclusive, exclusive right? So depending on the, the, the technology and the area and whether they are groupings or, or you know, of people, they can actually go and say, no, you can't register that. But in terms of the new and emerging uh, technologies, blockchain, I think I've done a uh, patent on blockchain. It's all protectable as well under patents and all that sort of thing. Thank you, Rumbi. Mr. Mjuru, can you support the young men made the profit? Okay, can Fortress help me if I come up with, uh, with a search engine? Um, I indeed, wh why shouldn't we help? That that's the whole idea behind uh, the innovation drive. Because what we are trying to do is to come up with homegrown solutions so that we don't continue to make use of, um, of foreign um, um, uh, inventions. So indeed, we will support if someone comes up with such an, an innovation. Yes, yes, Mr. Elijah. You said you pr you'll be able to protect. I mean, how Not will you protect to support? To support. Yes. How will you be able to, to support? Let, I have given an example like um, uh, where I was. Like if you go to, to any internet cafe or if you, do, if you go to any uh, government office, immediately on the, on the search, uh, let's say on Chrome, you'd see Yandex. Like the, it's, it's a mandatory thing that it's supposed to be done. If you buy a phone, if you put your, your SIM card, if you try to go on internet, immediately it will write Yandex. So, I mean, will you be able to, to, to support in that kind of framework? And block the other ones? Not kind of block exactly, but... Or make but them priority. But yeah, the priority be the local one. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't see any reason why we, we, we shouldn't be able to, 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 to support that. But, but of course, uh, there is the question of choice. Like she's saying, you, you can't block um, all the other search engines, especially in an environment like, like ours, because we still have a long way to go. If you look at countries like, uh, like China, they've come up with um, a, a their own vision of almost everything, you see. And uh, they, they are a big market, so they are able to do that. Yeah, but uh, indeed, we, we, we in, in whatever way we can, we will try and, and, and support. Even if for one way to come up with uh, their own WhatsApp, for example. We will support. But the challenge that we are facing with uh, most of these um, so-called innovations is somebody goes uh, on the internet, downloads something similar to WhatsApp, and he just make a few changes on the, on the front end, but the back end, it's still as it was, um, wherever it was taken from and they claim it, it was theirs. But you then ask, uh, okay, but where is this thing uh, hosted? You hear that it's hosted in Europe. So yes, to a certain extent, we can call that an innovation, but we still making use of those um, services that are out there, which we are trying to run away from. Not happening, but uh, Mr. Sabola, there's a young man who asked you those three questions. You able to assist? Uh, was it Afadzwa? 
Thank you, thank you. Uh, you asked a question about our relationship with music collection societies. And the other one was duration of copyright. Did I get it right? Yes, and then if, if, if I manage to register my copyright with Aripo, is there a fee? Okay, thank you very much. Th that third one I had missed. Yes, we and uh, Aripo and the music collection societies, we are related. <laughs> music collection societies, you know in Zimbabwe we, there is Zimura. Do you know that? Not Zimura, but Zimura. Zimbabwe Music Rights Association. One, we, uh, we have a mandate on copyright, which we are given in 2002. Uh, as such, we promote uh, the development of copyright in our member states, the 19 member states. And therefore, we also work with what we call uh, collection management organizations. Uh, sorry, not coll collective, collective management organizations. And in Zimbabwe, we have Zimura. We, where we have no CMOs, collective management organizations, we initiate uh, or we help to have that es established. I think uh, one example I can cite recently, I think, is Lesotho. There wasn't any, and the initiatives have been done and uh, the cabinet has approved establishment of uh, collective management organization. So we, we work with them. We, we do workshops, training programs with them on the management of uh, uh, those organizations. So we work hand in hand with them. And then duration of copyright. Copyright generally subsists as long as the author is alive and thereafter generally it's 50 years after you have kicked a bucket so you see it's a long time you say you can enjoy copyright throughout until you go deep down and even after you have gone you those who succeed uh, take over your property rights will enjoy for 50 years okay after you are gone so that's the duration. Now, the third one is if you register uh, your copyright, the other part was what? Yes. Okay. Registration, I said, uh, with copyright is automatic, but there is a voluntary registration. In a case of infringement, it is easy for you to prove that you are the owner of the copyright. So uh, voluntary registration, you can do it any time. Uh, it doesn't have a specific time. As long as you, you feel like registering, it's voluntary. Generally, uh, <coughs> it's just any time you want. You cannot, uh, we cannot specify that this is the time because it's just voluntary, just you can register and there is no specific time that we can give to that. I don't know if I have ably responded to your questions. Oh, no, no. Okay, okay. For registration, wh what we have at the moment as a repo, we have come up with a, a, a legal framework uh, for registering, um, for voluntary registration of copyright. And that one, I think there is no fee. Yes but we are taking it for approval for, to our administrative council. I think this coming this, the November, end of November. Once approved, then we can run with it in our 19 member states. Asante sana. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so, Harry, why stock last? Madam? And then, madam, and then who else? I want somebody who has not said anything. Have you said anything? Oh, you already have the microphone. Okay, I'm going to take three more. So this time I'll take the three, and then I'll take the last three, which is 
You, you, and the. Mm. Uh, my question has to do with technology transfer. Mm -hmm. So we know that um, Yahoo and Google, for example, started as projects at Stanford University, and okay. then there was a technology transfer process. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what models of technology transfer have you guys seen, um, and which ones would you suggest? Um, in Zimbabwe, hackathons are becoming quite popular, and um, everyone knows that tech is the way to go. So mm -hmm. for corporates that are thinking to invest in students, etc., cetera, what um, models of technology transfer can they adopt? Mr. Mjuru, can you take that up um, and take it down so we can respond to it? Um, Madam? Thank you. Well, my question is uh, related to... You didn't to introduce yourself. <laughs> Sorry about that. My name is Nessie Masunda. I'm a lecturer in the Technopreneurship Development Center at UT. Okay. I'm sure that does it for the introduction. Okay. Um, the question is related to why ICTs are used in SMEs. And I, I would like to, to... The question to be focused on the fourth aspect that was discussed during the presentation, the issue of blocking, of blocking competitors where we are saying there is someone who has been inventive or innovative, they've come up with an idea, and maybe a big someone who's already established, they just buy that invention, not for the purposes of using it, not for the purposes of consumers benefiting, mm -hmm. but for the purposes of just fighting competition. Then my question is, isn't that uh, a monopolistic tendency? Are there no laws that protect, because we are saying, as consumers, we are being mm -hmm. deprived of a, of access or choice to a certain product because a certain big someone has just taken the product so that they can stop this maybe SME who has come up with a new product. Are there no laws that can maybe deal with that um, kind of situation? Okay. Thank you. I think I'll give that one to Rumbi, right? Mm, to, to respond to it. Okay. The third person is... Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. You are, you've got a microphone already. <coughs> Thank you. Before I ask my person, would you allow me to uh, uh, maybe ask, I just need a point of clarification from the other gentleman. The gentleman from Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> may, may you clarify? He wants to find out if w the time that you were there, Vladimir Putin, was he, was he president? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. You can ask, sir. Okay. Um, there is... Um, search engine optimization and search engine marketing. Right. The two here are not necessarily um, governed by the telecommunications company or the regulators like Port was. But what I strongly feel helps in maybe pushing your brand or the search engine is basically um, collaborating with entrepreneurs, then maybe uh, uh, collectively um, talk to portras to open the gates for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm Thank sure um, from my, my, my background, little experience that I have, I've worked in the ICT industry uh, mm -hmm. doing web design. And I'm sure that's, we are all concerned. And if we come up together, maybe with your product and other products that are not yet on the market. I think it will work out in a good favor. Then coming to my question, um, copyright on software. Mm -hmm. We are, those who are in, into programming understand that there is um, a higher order language and the lower lo order language, meaning that uh, our approach to technology is not necessarily dumping the old technicality, but all what is being used these days can still interpret those old languages. So the, maybe the programming language, be it PHP, be it Java, SQL, you name it, okay, may not necessarily matter. But the content, what everybody else can read, I think it's it, sh it should be it should take centrality of copyright concepts mm -hmm. because if you go to those who can fool around on the computer if you go to www.gimp and ask for the source of any website 
they can still provide you with the okay with the hyper mark, uh, markup text language the language that has been used to make up that website okay so th the guys who do search engine marketing and search engine optimization those who are interested in speeding up uh, their traffic on the web okay easily adopt that language but what's important i think wha what people should not f uh, forget for those who are into content creation and uh, those who do creative writing, preserving the business concept, it should all be centered on what is being uh, said or the, or the exact text that has been said or what the uh, product is meant to be on the market. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, so that's your comment. It's a comment, right? Yeah, then second, yeah. Uh, okay, the, the last one, mm -hmm. we have a p product Okay, you talked about open systems, or open learning softwares, all right? Okay, and uh, the copyright that surrounds that. We have a software here called, um, maybe, let I'm, I'm giving an example. Let's say we're talking about Koha, the a library, an online library management software system. Music producers, um, librarians, educators can maybe curate their content and preserve it there. How safe is it, maybe for the general public or for, for maybe for everybody else who's here, mm -hmm. to affiliate to such uh, maybe archives and what protection is there from portraits, considering the magnitude that the, maybe the product is getting on the market? Okay, thank you. I think it's, uh, not necessarily pro trans, but uh, I'll give that to Rumbi as well to to respond to because it's um, I think people like or Aripo who actually deal with those issues of protection. So let me give her to respond to those questions, and then Mr. Mjuru will take one. Okay, so I'll start with the question on uh, anti-competitive practices. So basically, every country has law against unfair competition, which also apply to intellectual property rights. But um, it depends also, because um, I'm sure if you, you've heard globally, there are what we call patent trolls. So what people do is they look at patents that have just been registered, and if it's an important patent or something that they foresee in the next uh, maybe 10 years making impact, they buy out, right? Then they've got like maybe a hundred patents that they own uh, that are related to a specific industry. And then so when the big companies now come into play and say, okay, we're launching this new technology, they then enforce against them and say, you are enforcing, you are actually infringing on our IP right and you have to pay. So in some circumstances, you actually have to pay, you have to pay them and you have to get a license from these people who own this patent. So sometimes uh, the intellectual property system is that tricky. It's all about strategy. So if that patent is owned by a patent troll, someone who's not even practicing, who doesn't even go to work and doesn't even operate that technology, they can enforce against you if they own that patent. But then if you then go using the law of unfair competition and try to say, okay, these people are not using it, maybe we can, but it's a long and tedious process. So some people would just prefer to pay licenses and courts have actually granted them these licenses. But it's also coming together as a consortium and saying we want this to stop. But yeah, it's actually happening globally. And if they own the patents, I guess then they've, they have some certain rights that they have. Um, and then we go on to the question on, um, uh, you know, saying, uh, I think there was one comment on uh, copyright and this higher level, lower level order language. In terms of uh, copyright infringement, there are percentages that are assigned to say you've copied what percentage of, of the original work. So yes, there may be things that are just uniform in terms of all programming languages, but then to, to what extent have you then gone further? So if it's a, a small percentage of your code, then it's, it's okay. So there's a certain level of percentage that you should not go beyond to say you've just taken it as it is, 
you've just added a few lines of code and you are saying it's your product. And again, infringement is when you then commercially utilize whatever it is that you're creating. You can do this for academic purposes and use something for academic purposes, it's okay. But infringement, usually, we look at whether you're now using it in a commercial sense. You know, and you've co copied 80%. So then that, that can't work if you're doing it commercially. If, you're if it's less than that, depending on the national law, then, you know, that can be applied. And then in terms of people uh, putting their content on open source uh, platforms, like I said, with open source, you have to do due diligence. So you, I think there is some, uh, there are some platforms that you go on and you search a certain community and see whether they are reliable, honest, or secure, who owns it, who funds it, who runs it, for you to be able to see whether you should use it. You should not just use any, any open source platform. And in terms of data, it's depending on the license. Remember when you register on these uh, platforms, you click and agree to terms and conditions. So you may be, if you don't read those terms and conditions, you may actually be giving them permission to use your data and do everything else. So even though those terms and conditions may be two or three pages long, you have to read before you click agree when you're logging in, signing in, or <coughs> uploading your data. Thank you. Let's read small print, guys. The small print, because they always place it in small print, the terms and conditions. Mr. Mujuru? Yes, um, thank you. Um, technology transfer models. I, I, I can't claim to be an expert in that area, but uh, I, I have my own opinion, which I think can be backed up by, by others in this room who could be knowledgeable in that area. I, I think um, um, one approach to technology transfer that I would, I would recommend is the, the, the Chinese route, where the Chinese allowed um, other countries, companies from other countries to come in, establish themselves in China, develop factories there, and to start employing Chinese people in those factories. And over time, the Chinese acquired the, the, the knowledge and skills, and to, they've now started chasing those people away. And uh, they are now one of the biggest uh, countries in terms of technology, the production of technology in the world. Uh, that, that's one approach that I, 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 I would recommend. But I, I don't know if uh, we've got other people in the room who can uh, articulate that area better than me. Okay, so in terms of technology transfer, like you've highlighted, there are different models. Um, Mr. Mjuri has just talked about the, 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 the one that he's mentioned about, you know, learning. And then the intellectual property system itself is a method of uh, technology transfer. The whole purpose of the patent databases is for technology transfer, where the full disclosure of patents means you can actually utilize the information contained therein. And another strategy that was used by the Chinese was the reverse engineering. So what they did, they did not have intellectual property laws until recently. So they would take those patents, utilize them, build products. You know, at times we're saying they are fake, poor quality products, but they were learning. And then they got to a point where they improved on that and they were getting a very good quality. And now they're the biggest filer of patents in the world. Japan, China, South Korea. But they started by reverse engineering the patents. And then when it comes to also technology transfer with companies, you have to have a system in place, whether you want to work with academic institutions, like you talked about Stanford University. What happens is that the university can now protect its intellectual property. Remember also technology transfer is highly based on intellectual property. You transfer what is protected so that you, as a company, you can also make uh, a, 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 you know, a commercial gain. So what usually happens is the universities protect their innovations, but they do not have capacity to start up the company or implement, or they don't even have time. So what you do is you go and buy that, you can license, they can assign it to you an exclusive, non-exclusive basis. There are all these different types of models that you adopt. But then what you have from an academic institution is that you have the lecturers and faculties and students that can help you implement as you go along. And then you can also adopt uh, uh, technologies from the innovators who are not in institutions, but you also have to be aware of their knowledge and skill levels and how you implement 
that if they don't have advanced skills for you to, you know, take it to the market. Thank you. I'm going to take the last three. The gentleman with the glasses on the forehead. And then, um, who else didn't talk? Okay, the gentleman with the, with the microphone. I, I, you, you had a chance to speak, didn't you? Okay, and then we're going to have the gentleman there. And then the gentleman here. Tiny head, guys. So can we quickly, can we avoid Norond? Let's just ask the questions so that we accommodate more people. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Mine was just a quick response oh, to okay. what she was asking about the issue of uh, technology transfer. Mm -hmm. I want to point to some practical examples in our own situation. Mm -hmm. We end up probably, I mean, uh, importing some of the technologies that we can actually make up of uh, our Consoles. own source here. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example probably of the BVR system mm -hmm. that was used in the previous uh, election. Mm -hmm. You like that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was just a, a, a simple s a system, simple okay. technology that mm -hmm. we could have probably imported raw components and assembled here. But uh, in that regard, uh, the government refused to go to tender uh, for whatever reasons. We do not. <laughs> you mean? You want to attend or participate in the tender? No, the, we have got. I'm, I'm, I'm answering with regards to the issue of technology transfer ah, from okay. the university. All right. So, if so it's an example. If we had gone to the university mm -hmm. and requested that our institutions, probably we've got HIT, NAS, we've got uh, uh, MSU with this. With we create this those innov innovation hubs there, mm -hmm. and then empower them to build these technologies over okay. years. That is, uh, it does, doesn't take. You know what? The, the good thing about technology is that you can take advantage of the technology today. Okay. We might not need so much time. Mm -hmm. You can leap, adopt, and adapt. Okay. Yeah. So that that was basically my Your response, comment. and and probably pointing to the issue of innovation hubs mm -hmm. in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, those are crucial. Uh, I mean models of trying to facilitate transfer. Okay. Because students, they do uh, projects uh, when they are doing their academic, as part of their academic requirements. Mm -hmm. So those projects can actually be taken up and scaled up post-graduation uh, and supported probably through those innovation hubs. And I think in that regard, I also point to my uh, sister Stella who is here. She, she's an expert in that field as well. Yeah, but the lady that you're responding to is like, please, please, I need to say something. That's what she's doing. She's like, please, please, can I say something? Okay. Hmm. Uh, Who owns okay. the I'll IP? Give, I'll, I'll give a specific uh, example of mm -hmm. probably the Technopark at the National University of Science and Technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, you would negotiate a deal where the university can own up to 30% mm -hmm. and then you own up to 70% mm -hmm. or even more, but the university would have to own something. But uh, someone, some presenter said it's better to own, to, uh, I mean, 10% of an elephant than 100% of a rat. Mm -hmm. So you've got somewhere to, to start from. Okay. And we have that project probably uh, deposited in some lab and it's roast there and mm -hmm. you're out there moving around with cut and blow, with a CV and you can't find a job. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate your contribution. I think it's very valuable. So can we have, sir, uh, is it related? I'm going to be nice. Uh, I'm a nice person. So please excuse me. You also wanted to say something about that. Okay, you're okay. Oh, so she's saying thank you. Very quick. Hello. Okay, so it's a vote of thanks before they ask a vote of thanks. So thank you for a try. I just wanted to say, can you please kindly provide the slides? They're very helpful. Yes. I'm um, on your website or you know, we can collaborate with other um, media companies. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, so thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. Do you have a microphone? Okay. Uh -huh. Uh, my, Go ahead. Na my name is Fortune Dube. I'm a freelance data scientist and a good hacker. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, so my, actually something happened uh, a few years ago when I was into content creation. I sent a proposal to Zeno, right? Uh, no names. <laughs> it, I'm not, I know, but mm -hmm. so 
then uh, actually I was proposing to do, uh, to do the uh, content. Actually, it was a time when we had a, a water crisis in Bluewell. Okay. So basically what they did, they actually took the sample. Actually, I took a picture of mine, actually, and I created a nice graphic. Then they were like, I'll get back to you. Two weeks later, they used my picture in their Save Water campaign. And so actually when you're talking about the stuff, I was like, okay, so it means I'm a rich man. So I wanted to ask, how much can, can I get out of that? <laughs> We are not creating thieves. We are not going to create that. But I think uh, you'll be guided by Rumbi on a serious note. He, she'll, she'll be able to guide you. But I would like you to maybe um, see her. She's available. Uh, you, can, you can have a side chat on how you can uh, nicely talk to the parastatal. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. She will guide you. Okay, the next question. All right, thank you very much. My name is Umo Japiri. Uh -huh. I'm with a research institution called SAFEM Africa. Okay. And this question is directed at uh, Dr. Sabola, uh -huh. so Dorum can, can come in on it. Um, I know the, the crux of today's meeting was focusing on Zimbabwe, but I think as a research institution, we've spent a lot of time trying to understand what's happening with the Africa Free Trade Agreement. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also, our perspective is that it's better to serve a much bigger market than to try and serve 13 million people. Mm -hmm. So with the um, going away of the borders, pretty much from an economic perspective, how will these territorial rights continue to vest when Africa becomes just one big land? Bearing in mind that Aripo controls 19 countries mm -hmm. and there are 54, 55, maybe 56 African states. And then also um, you mentioned that there's a francophone uh, focused um, intellectual property institution um, which controls about 17 countries. So wha what will happen when Africa becomes one landmass? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think um, those were the three. I think he assisted us on the response. Um, we've asked him to have a side meeting with him. So basically I think we can talk to uh, Doc and then take the last three, the last three gentlemen and ladies. Thank you very much indeed. That's a, a very good question. Indeed, uh, we have 19 member states and OAPI has 17 member states and there are some countries which are not uh, in either grouping. What, should, what happens is this. There are the following ways you, you may want to protect your IP. If it is local, like for example here in Zimbabwe, you want Zimbabwe only, you may work with Zippo or Aripo because we are already here, it's okay. Now, if you want to protect in other countries, which are member states, you go through Aripo, it is done. For those other countries which are uh, French speaking, they have their own system which you can go through. However, World over, there is also the international uh, <coughs> way of doing it. For example, if you want to apply for a patent, uh, not only in Africa, but even beyond the continent, there is a way of uh, uh, doing it internationally through WIPO. WIPO is an abbreviation, World Intellectual Property Organization. The headquarters is in Geneva. Uh, they have an international system for registration of patents, trademarks, and all other types of IP. And then you apply through uh, their regional bureau. I do not want to go through uh, all that. I do not have all, all that time. But there is that international way whereby you can apply uh, for protection in countries beyond the continent. So you, you, you can check, uh, you can Google, like for example, uh, the SPCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty. It will give you all the details. Ja, ja, or, or Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property, just as an example. It will give you all those details. Thank you very much. Thank you. Makombi, um, kumbakwedo anopera. Anopera na five. So, Mati? I think I'm good at all. 
saka imma mboti mutura kuvunza mbuzi oh saka we are taking the last three. One, two. you wambo vunza iwe so i'm going to give him a chance uh yeah okay uh, thank you i'd like to start off by thanking portrust for continuing to support um technology ICT. Last week we had a STEM film launch, an event where we're encouraging more girls to take up technology. And as you can see, we can count the number of girls in the room. Mm. We still have lots of work to do. Okay, my comment goes to all the students who are in here. We have what are called Innovator Sub Clubs in universities. Please go and join the Innovator Sub Club at university. There are a lot of opportunities there. There are a lot of talks that we arrange and we help you guys with this whole idea of being scared that your ideas will be stolen. Where do you get investors? How do you go about if you have a brilliant idea? And we work closely with Portress and other investors. So please join the Innovator Sub Club at your institution and we continue to build a better Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that's a comment. Um, so we can accommodate your question because that's a comment. Thank you so much. Hello. Sir? Hello. Do you have a microphone, sir? Okay. Okay, you can go ahead. Hello. Yes, you can go ahead. M mine is a, a short one. O on, on trademarks. Okay. We, uh, we have, uh, say, on, on logos, we have uh, these signs like R, SM, and TM. What are the distinctions? What, what are the differences between tho those three? And uh, if I would like to have my my logo with uh, that sign, wh wh what are the processes to, to go about it? RSM and TM. Uh, okay. The trademark and the other one. I think it's a registered. The registered. Yes, okay. Oh, so it's the procedure on how to go about it. You got that, Rumbi? Is it the same thing? And is it the same thing? Okay, sir. Uh, okay, um, my, my question is like how China have developed and um, over time their products have now reached a standard where they are now world class. I'm, I'm looking at a Zim, the Zim context where the trust on, on Zimbabwean products yeah, is, 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 is so low. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back of uh, Paris Data that was flight attender. They wanted software, and then they were asking for requirements like it should be in the quadrant, magic quadrant. I mean, these are all international grading companies for software. I mean, should it take a, 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 an initiative from the top where they say uh, local companies are encouraged to, to come, at least let them bid and let the product be seen, that mm -hmm. exposure, mm -hmm. um, rather than just even where we can't even bid anymore because we, we don't even have capacity to even it actually costs money to, to be evaluated by those guys and, and they usually write what you want them to write because you've paid them. So I'm mm -hmm. just saying those are the considerations we need to think. To and have in mind, at. okay. Rumbi, you do that? You take that one? Uh, like, uh, so it's to maybe to portray that maybe from a government perspective, perspective what are okay. the initiatives? Can they make it in mandatory that local companies should be encouraged to build, like how oh, they say women, mm -hmm. uh, can you respond to I this? I encourage you know, to so apply. Yeah, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, okay. Yeah. Poor trans, Ms. Samjuri. Sir, your question? Okay, thank you. Um, I once heard from someone who claimed that uh, they are knowledgeable in the area of uh, intellectual property, mm -hmm. that uh, if, you, if you are in that phase where you are uh, not uh, financially uh, where you don't have the financial means to to protect your idea, mm -hmm. they say that you could actually write your your idea in in great detail mm -hmm. on paper and then mail it to yourself uh, uh, via the post, and then keep it sealed. Mm -hmm. And they say that it is it will actually it can actually uh, uh, help you if w if push comes to shove to mm -hmm. prove uh, maybe in the court of law that you are the one who came up with the idea, okay. and then also. Uh, uh, I was wondering if there's anything that can be done for uh, people who are maybe uh, are not part of it. Uh, they are not students at any university, mm -hmm. but uh, they would like to. They would like help to in developing their ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, there was a time when I 
when I needed like a CNC machine to mm -hmm. develop a, a certain uh, a part of my project. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to my former uh, university and I couldn't, they couldn't help me. Mm -hmm. So I, I was actually wondering if there's something that, sh that can be done to help us and mm -hmm. uh, so that the universities can uh, maybe uh, uh, allow us to, 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 to uh, still use the same facilities. Yes. Okay. Mr. Mjuri, you'll take that? Or should I? Oh, okay, you can answer that. So you start with that question, and then we'll go to Rumbi and Samjul. Um, for people who are no longer students, I know there are a lot of hubs now in Zimbabwe. You have B2C, you have the SciTech incubator, you have um, Impact Hub. There are a lot of hubs now. So you can approach them and try to get help. And with the university hubs, the innovators hubs that are there now, they have that provision for ex-students. So you can try and pursue those avenues. Thank you. Talk to it. But talk to her. Remember, we say this is also a networking platform. So you identify where people who can assist you so that you can leverage on these relationships that we've created here. So Rumbi, if you can. All right. So maybe just firstly as a comment to the Africa Free Trade Agreement. And just to say, in terms of the Africa Free Trade Agreement, I think the first round was completed, but the second round is going to actually take into consideration the intellectual property issues. And again, if you are aware, the African Union uh, actually launched the Pan-African Intellectual Property Office, which is PIPO, which is now, which is a way that they're trying to actually do regional integration in terms of IP filings and protection. And then for the SM and TMs, SM is for the service mark. So remember, there the are service marks that are protected as trademarks, which are for maybe if you are institutes of engineers, if you are approved, or a body of similar people who have certain standards. So they can put a service mark, and then they put SM. And then TM is for someone uh, a name that you are claiming that you want to own as a trademark, and you haven't registered it at the IP office or any other office. Uh, yes, so it's, it's not yet registered. Or some will, will just may rely on it as a well-known mark and not go into the, the trademark registration. And then so when it, has t when it now has ARA, it means it has been filed for and it has been registered. There's a certificate to show this. And then um, in terms of the emailing, I think um, that is not actually very correct. That works for copyright. So when in copyright you're trying to prove the date that you actually wrote something, you can email it to yourself or you can actually mail it to yourself using DHL or whatever and then you keep it sealed. And you can also do that via email. But our, in terms of patents and other uh, in, uh, industrial property, uh, what the, the law says, it's a first to file system, not a first to invent system. So what, what, what it means is that if the first person to go and file for an application at an IP office is the, the default owner, not the first person who invented. So that has to be very clear. Someone can invent, but someone files. So what they use, because it's very difficult to assess the, 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 the invention, because two people can independently develop the same thing at the same time. But the person who goes to file first is the one that's considered to own. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you. The, the question is on. Um, whether it is possible to consider local companies in, in tenders and exclude uh, foreign companies. Uh -huh. uh, okay, I, th I think uh, we, we all agree that there, there is need to, 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 to favor our own when we, we are doing evaluations, it's, it's something that is generally uh, ag agreed. But um, the, the only challenge that, that, that comes at times is you, you find um, uh, someone who is a briefcase uh, business person 
he doesn't have um, anything on the ground, but he is a tender preneur. Anything that comes up, he wants to participate in it. And in the process, he makes the product very expensive. So those are the challenges, uh, some of the challenges that are, that, that, that are there. But uh, really, there is nothing wrong with uh, protecting our own uh, local industries if they are real industries that are producing those uh, products. I don't know if anyone else can, can add to that. Oh, yeah. I think that's about the response that we, we have at the moment. Um, a round of applause for our presenters, please, and those who are giving us some information on that. So we go to the end of our program where we're going to have a vote of thanks. Like I said, we said in the beginning, um, we were in Blauayo last week on the 11th, where we also had a full house, and we had the operators there, our telecoms operators, uh, and the postal services operators, postal including the courier services uh, operators, who are your DHLs, your FedExes, your Zimposts, those are our courier, the Swifts, and all that. And then we also had our uh, mobile operators and uh, the internet uh, guys. Um, we had our tail ones, we had our liquids and uh, um, our power tails, and then our Econet Telesel Net one. So here, this morning we this morning we had we had those guys ar ar around as well. Some of them, they couldn't. Some of them couldn't make it this here to ha the Harare one. But uh, they were, you know, they definitely were supporting us. We believe that. Uh, so we're going to go to the closing uh, remarks. In Blauayo, we, we, we had an innovator that uh, was representing everybody, or the participants, basically you, um, giving the closing re uh, some closing remarks. And then industry representative, which was given by Telwan in Blauayo. So we're going to give a chance to somebody else before we give to Telwan. Uh, because they're the ones who, who address us in Blauayo. Um, I saw, I think I saw other operators. I don't know if they're still around. And then we will then close our program. So, I'm going to ask somebody that will represent all of you here. Preferably somebody who did not speak today. I have a volunteer because I know the capability of all of you so I shall volunteer someone oh you're gonna do that thank you so much and this is the first time you're talking so you're gonna introduce yourself first the organization you know our format you had our format yeah thank you good evening everyone uh, my name is Laino Tarumbwa I am a business development associate with Four Qubits Advisory, which also happens to be working with South Africa in research. Our goal is to capacitate people to make better decisions through key insights and information. Because if you are doing market research, but you don't actually know what the market is like, then you are going to have trouble with planning. I think uh, earlier someone was asking, how do I plan for my expenses? So that's where we come in and we're helping people to actually plan better and see what could come in the future. What do you need to create as a buffer for those expenses that might actually come out of the blue? I did not introduce where I'm from. I am a data person, so I'm always not in numbers. I had five people say they are from Mutasa district. I am also from Mutasa district, under Chief Mutasa. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember the song P.O. Box Watsomba P.O. <laughs> Most of you should be married by now. If you are not married by now, you should start thinking about it. Uh, I'm from Moe Shumba village. Um, this was such a crucial um, discussion we had today. We came across it on Sunday evening. Then yesterday we decided we actually need to attend because you need to be speaking to the people who are actually in industry. The key insights or the information we're getting on intellectual property is something you might not be thinking of planning about, but 
if you follow the sequence of the speakers when they began speaking about your value being in the intellectual property, the business can only be better if it has that key aspect that distinguishes it from the rest of the competition. And the whole business planning discussion we had with Dr. Chirisa, it's something we appreciated a lot. So we want to actually thank our presenters from Rumbi to Dr. Chirisa and the guys from Potras. From the beginning when the acting director general, the finance director came in and he began speaking about how we want to focus on capacitating these technopreneurs, I was engaged from that start, from that point. And when you begin speaking back and forth and you had guys asking about how can Potras actually support us? So the question we are going to leave is, are you going to actually set up a help desk? Because we can actually send through our proposals every now and again. But if we do not have that help desk, we can walk in at in Mount Pleasant and actually ask, what's the next way forward? How can I actually get on forward? It's not going to be a key discussion. It's just for the sake of talking. But those key action points, I hope you are going to be able to help us. And from our side, we are actually coming out with better knowledge. Someone was asking me, as a business consultant, are you here to get new clients? The reason we are here is we want to actually understand the client better. How can we improve their business planning? How can we help them make better decisions leading to better business outcomes? So on behalf of the technopreneurs and on behalf of the business development people who are here, we'd love to thank our presenters and Potras for this opportunity. Thank you. I think that was good representation because the loudness of the clap. But I'm going to charge him for advertising, though. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's it. And then we go on to, oh, you also want to say, you want to buttress the point. <laughs> OK. Um, afternoon. Um, I think I'm going to thank the presenters on behalf of the students in here. Uh, I think this was a great opportunity for us to learn a lot of stuff. Um, I, I still remember when we were back at our hostels, we used to debate on this issue where lecturers would literally uh, uh, give us pressure. And then other students would say uh, they literally want to get something out of our projects so that they can make money. Um, so when I go back there, I'm going to tell my colleagues, which are not, which didn't make it here, that uh, you can actually patent your uh, property, your intellectual property. So I would say, on behalf of these students, we are very grateful for this opportunity. <laughs> I, I'm from UZ, University of Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see Teleso. I think they've left. Econet was sitting at the back there. I don't see them. I think they've just uh, gone as well. Is there anybody else besides Tel One who are not here? Because I can see Tel One right there. Um, so that we give others a chance. Going once, twice. Goes to Tel One. So Tel One, if you can give us some sort of vote of thanks or something, just to encourage the young people who are here. Uh, I introduced myself as Nyashamange, uh, working for Tel One. I would like to thank uh, you very much for the opportunity to pass a vote of thanks on behalf of Tel One. Of course, I wasn't prepared for this. I just came. <laughs> Well, uh, since the mic has been given to me, thank you very much, the presenters. And uh, it, this program really was an eye-opening for me. And uh, I've learned uh, quite a lot. Uh, and as someone who is uh, also uh, trying to, get to be an entrepreneur, as an individual, not as, tell, as an individual, I really benefited. And I've actually took uh, some contacts of... Uh, individuals that I think uh, can help me from now onwards who have been representing and those that I talked to. Thank you very much, uh, Potras, for 
this program. Well, thank you. Um, again, is on behalf of Portrise, we want to thank you for being patient and uh, spending the day, one, for actually coming in your numbers to come and take advantage of this program. The Innovation Drive belongs to you. Um, as an organization, it's one of our mandates um, that uh, we should actually promote ICT innovation within the country and also for you to be able to uh, get the opportunities in the global market for you to for you to bring back that investment to our country and develop our country. I think you are aware that ICTs are a key enabler uh, to any sector of the economy. So basically, we are the people that are holding the economy, the economy in our in the palm of our hands. So we want to thank you for coming, for attending, and also for taking the time to the questions that you, the clarities and the questions that you wanted to ask. And um, our um, presenters are available. I'm sure all of them, you saw that they had uh, their contact details there. We are going to send uh, some, the slides. We're going to post them on our website, Mr. Mujuru, right? Yes, yeah, so on our website. And I know that Texim and Technomag also had said they were going to, um, if we give them the slides, they're also going to post them on their, on their platforms as well. So, what is uh, left for me is to say, Tatenda Siabonga, um, Tolumba, right? Tolumba, is it? Yeah? Asante sana. Okay, <laughs> asante sana. Thank you so much. Let's meet uh, online and uh, at the office. We are, we've moved from 30 the chase. We are now at number 1008 performance close, which is along Norfolk Road in Mount Pleasant. Um, Come, let's uh, innovate. Thank you. Good evening.